Christ, suffering at the hands of Rome, because they believed in Christ alone. They died through Europe, especially Spain, for they saw all but Christ is vain. He suffered by his death for men to save them from their awful sin. Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand. The Roman popes rule the land. Those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy. We won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie, with 50 million reasons why. Salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. A sovereign God give faith to man, salvation's in the Maker's hand. This gospel offends Rome today. They offer up another way, a counterfeit, a compromise. Beware the ancient papal lie with such a cloud of witnesses who by grace died in their Lord. Recall their memory to say, by the same faith we live today. And you pay me in tithes, 10%. You want to get rich? You got to pay me. I'm the priest. See, they built our churches, our Protestant churches, after the very image of Rome. You want to be rich? We want to help you. We'll give you the gospel. You give us our, your money, and then we'll give your money to the World Council of Churches, the National Council of Churches, the ecumenical movement, We'll be able to make more movies like the Left Behind series that will lead you into the pits of hell, that will convince you the Pope is not the Antichrist, that he's some fool that looks like Mitt Romney, some temple-grade Mitt Romney that will show up about seven years before Jesus Christ returns, and uh, then you'll have your Antichrist. But in the meantime, we are the shepherds, and we will help you. How many of you have truly been helped? How many of my listeners tonight have been truly helped by those false shepherds behind the pulpits who never told you a word about the Antichrist of the Bible, the prophetic, historical, and biblical Antichrist? Who ever told you about the scarlet heart of the Revelation chapter 17 and how she in the dark days controlled all the kings of Europe and enslaved every man, woman, and child and is doing it again today right here in Protestant America. Where else would you expect to hear that truth but from the pulpits of your church? And it's the biggest secret going today. How many of your pastors would tell you the truth about the ecumenical movement of Rome to reunite all the rebels, the Protestant rebels, back under the authority of the triple tyrant from Rome. Not a one of them. And you owe them nothing but condemnation. Identify them. Shine the light of the gospel on those dark dogs. The survival of this Christian nation, this Protestant nation depends on it. And if we shrink from that responsibility, we deserve each and every one of us to be slaves and to fall martyrs for the truth and cast aside as dogs. You say that's strong medicine, Tom? Well, listen, for the ailments that we have today, we need strong medicine. No pain, no gain. 
no pain, no gain. Let me tell you, the pain that we'll suffer for telling the truth in this country is nothing compared to the pain that Rome intends to inflict on everybody that won't bend her knee to either the papacy or the civil government that represents her. Look how your police departments are all militarizing. They've got the most sophisticated war-making material that the, that, the, that the U.S. Army, the U.S. Navy, the U.S. Air Force, and Marines can muster. The, industrial com- the military and industrial complex has just given all their hand-me-downs to the local police. Why? Because they're fixing to make war. Of course, nobody's going to tell them they're kill- killing the heretics for the Roman Catholic Church. That might wake up a few of them. So they're just going to call us religious fanatics or domestic terrors, terrorists or whatever name they can attach to us to justify those ignorant police forces to kill God's people. And all we want is liberty, the liberty that made us free, the liberty that bought us from condemnation to everlasting life. Henry Gratton Guinness, I apologize. I'm not getting very far in the book tonight, but man, you won't hear this anywhere else, I swear. I've never heard it anywhere else. Henry Gratton Guinness continues at the bottom of page 223. He says, the 16th century, that is the 1500s, he's talking specifically about the Cross Reformation, He said the 16th century was the age of the Reformation. The church had become frightfully deformed. It needed to be thoroughly reformed. Let me tell you, what church was he talking about? Was there any deformation in the body of Christ, or did they hold to Christ and hold against Antichrist? Of course they did. That's why Rome killed them. So he's got to be talking about the Roman Catholic Church. It needed to be thoroughly reformed, except for the fact that the Bible says it is irreformable. It is what it is because it was prophesied to be what it is, to try the saints as if by fire. Isn't that what it says? And they all have been tried. Not as if by fire, but by fire. And so will we. That's Rome's calling card. Burn them. Burn them to the ground. Put them in their churches and light it a fire. That's what she did all over Europe, killing God's people. Loading them up in their churches and lighting them a fire just to praise God. They killed a heretic in the name of Jesus Christ. Aren't we so holy? That's right. That church needs to be reformed, but it won't be reformed until Christ returns and destroys it with the spirit of his mouth. It had departed from the faith, says Henry Grattan Guinness. It needed to be brought back to it. It needed a restoration of non-apostate Christianity. A reassertion was required of rights, divine and rights human. The Pope had taken away all their rights. They wanted their rights back. They wanted Christ's rights given back to us. He says the papacy had subverted both the government of God and the liberties of man. You didn't hear it from me. You heard it from Henry Grattan Dennis. He just told you exactly what I've been telling you. The papacy had subverted both the government of God and the liberties of man. That's Rome's whole purpose, to usurp the government of God and to make slaves of us all. Its central principle involves the expulsion from the world of its rightful ruler, Christ the Savior, and substitutes for him a dynasty of blasphemous usurpers a dynasty of blasphemous usurpers, a dynasty. 
2,000-year dynasty of blasphemous usurpers. Who's he talking about? Does anybody want to raise their hand? I can't see you. But he's talking about none other than the papacy from its very beginning to the present day. And it involves equally the destruction of all man's noblest rights. It denies to him his lawful access to his maker, capital M. Did you know the papacy denies Roman Catholics access to their rightful maker? Because he says, I'm the go-between. If you want to get to God, you've got to go through me. And if you want to go through me, you've got to obey me. And you've got to pay me. And you've got to go out and conquer the rest of the world for me. The triple tyrant, the inquisitor, the inquisition, the crusades, conquer the whole world for the Pope. Right? It denies to him his lawful access to his maker. A fellow mortal, a pretended priest, stands in the way and blocks the path of eternal life. Did you know that's the very purpose of the Roman Catholic priest? He's a fellow mortal, a sinner, born of sin. There's only one man that's righteous, and that's the man Christ Jesus. The priests of Rome are the lowest of the human genome. Mortal sinners, world-class sinners, murderers, persecutors of the saints, sinners, usurpers of Christ's rightful throne, usurpers of his of, of, of his service to his people, false confessors, pretended priests. They are no priests. They are no priests at all. Never mind the pious garb they wear and the fancy things they do with their hands and their feet. They're not holy. They are diabolical. They, only, they are only pretended priests. You know, God has a whole nation of kings and priests. And I are one, and so are you. The law of liberty. But that pretended priest wants to make you a slave to him, a spiritual slave and a physical slave too. And that's the mark of the priests of the Roman Catholic Church. The pedophiles, the warmongers, the liars, the usurpers, the blasphemers, the, the idolaters, the simoniacs, they are all of that and then some. The Bible speaks of them specifically. They are fellow mortals, fallen, wicked. You know what Paul said in regards to our human fallen state? He called us, he said, our vile bodies, my vile body. Well, the priests of Rome are the vilest of the vile. Fellow mortals, a pretended priest who stands in the way and blocks the path of eternal life. How does he block the path of eternal life? Simply by saying, to go to heaven, you have to obey me. You have to confess your sins to me. Me, a mere mortal sinner. He stands across the sunshine of God's love and casts upon the trembling human spirit a deadly shade. He claims to have the keys of heaven and hell. He thunders lying anathemas, lying curses, and forbids mankind to approach the throne of infinite mercy except through him, and then only just so far as he permits. Thus, Christ is eclipsed. Salvation is stolen. The papal priest is substituted for the Savior of sinners, the mystery of iniquity for the mystery of godliness, the proud Pope of Rome for the holy Prince of Peace, poison for food, 
and Satan himself is palmed upon the church of Jesus Christ as her head and her husband. What a cursed system, said the author, Henry Grattan Guinness. What a cursed system. Thought can scarcely fathom the abyss of evil which it creates. That's right. Jesus is the creator of all heaven and earth. He said, the earth is mine and the fullness thereof. But what does the papacy, the counterfeit of Christ, create? Nothing but an abyss of evil. Nothing but an abyss of evil. A bottomless pit of evil. It arrests the flowing of heaven's waters in the wilderness and turns the streams of life to stagnant, putrid blood. It arrests the shining of heaven's holy light, the illuminating influence of gospel truth, and plunges the world, the blind, deaf, and dumb world, in gloom and darkness so gross that it may be felt. It arrests the healing hand of divine grace and forgiveness and substitutes for it the polluting touch of priestly fingers, stained and contaminated with lust, hypocrisy, and blood. It changes grace, that sweet and sacred mystery, spiritual, holy, not of this world, free, oh, how free! And how divine. For it is the Spirit's influence. It changes this into a mystical abomination, an insufferable compound, a something manipulated by the fingers of hypocrites, ministered, as they say, through sacraments and sacraments of their own invention and their own management. Seven sacraments. Seven sacraments. Forsooth. A something transmitted to through a generation of pretended vicars of Christ and their agents and doled out by them to a dying world for pecuniary considerations. That's a word that's fallen out of disuse in this world today, so I'll explain it to you. Pecuniary, that means for money. The Bible says for filthy lucre. Pretended Christs dole out their grace for pecuniary consideration. Do they not blush to perpetuate such damnable deceptions? Have the eternal interests of men no value in their eyes? Is the grace of God to be transmuted to a vile currency that it may be deposited in the pockets of priests and circulated by them as base coin is by rogues and vagabonds? Is conscience utterly dead within them? Dead? It's as good as dead. Seared with a hot iron, says the Bible, till it has lost the sense of right and wrong and can no longer feel the infamy of doctrines and deeds which would have made the men of Sodom blush with shame. A system which travesties the truth, hardens the conscience, enslaves the mind, corrupts the heart, which buries the Bible, prostitutes the ministry, profanes the sacraments, persecutes the saints, betrays and butchers the flock of Jesus Christ and outrages all that is sacred and all that is divine, deserves and demands. Listen carefully deserves and demands to be exposed, detested, judged, destroyed, and swept out of an injured world. That's Henry Grattan Guinness. A true Protestant. 
Yes, he believed in Jesus. He was blood bought. He was a bond servant of Jesus Christ. He heaped all the glory and praise on Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. But he also put the burden upon you and me, fellow servants of Christ, that we be that we expose, detest, judge, destroy, and sweep out of this injured world the papacy and the scarlet heart of Revelation 17. We've got to wake up, God's people to the historic, the biblical, and the prophetic Antichrist that has deceived them, that has made them slaves, and that plans to kill them if they won't submit spiritually and physically in the new world order to the Pope of Rome. Did I say it before, by the way, that the new world order that you hear so much about is not new at all? It's simply the old world order restored, the dark ages restored, For light, the light of the gospel, the law of liberty, is destroyed, and the darkness reigns supreme in the world once again. That the papacy, that triple tyrant, reigns once again supreme in the world over all the governments and the people and the land, and the air, and the sea. The earth is his, and the fullness thereof. Remember? Would to God that this truth could be heard all over the world, not just sleeping, slumbering United States of America, but South America, where Roman Catholicism rules supreme. Europe where Roman Catholicism rules supreme, where the other branches of the Babylonian religion rule supreme in India, China, Tibet, Thailand, all of the world wanders after the beast. Guinness continues. He says, and God raised up the Protestant Reformation to do this work of protest, of exposure, of condemnation and deliverance, to restore to men his word, to restore to them their rights, to open the eyes of nations, to raise them and make them stand upon their feet as responsible and free to roll off their spirits the dark incubus, the eternal nightmare of Roman priestly imposture and tyranny, to reestablish the ordinances and privileges of pure and primitive religion. Such was the work of the Protestant Reformation, which God wrought in Europe three centuries ago at the time of the writing of this book. Do you know the truth? Anarche, it was... 500 years ago that the Protestant Reformation brought liberty, Christ's liberty to all of Roman Catholic Europe. And do you know, according to the prophet Daniel, God gave the Jews 490 years, just 10 years shy of 500 years to receive their Messiah to go back to Israel, to rebuild the temple, to begin the sacrificial system again so that when the real Lamb of God came to wash away their sins, they'd be ready to receive him. But he gave them only 490 years. That prophecy was for the Jews and for Jerusalem. And of course, we all know That 490 years came and went, and Israel as a nation rejected Jesus Christ and became abject slaves and are enslaved to this day. Is God a respecter of persons? 
Does God treat the Gentiles any different than the Jews? If he gave the Jews 490 years to come to the truth, why would he give the Gentiles any longer? It's been 500 years. It's been over 500 years since 1517. Our time's up. If God is fair, why should the Gentiles be given any more time than were the Jews given? Just a thought. I'm not trying to add to the scriptures or take anything away, but the Bible does say God is no respecter of persons. And as I reflected over Daniel's prophecy in Daniel chapter 9 and the 490-year period predicted by Daniel as given to him by the archangel Gabriel. 490 years, 70 weeks of years, 490 years. And it came about just exactly as it was given by the prophet Daniel. That's why I have so much confidence in Daniel's prophecies. But the light came to Europe. The truth of the gospel came to Europe in 1517. 2017 marks 500 years, 10 years longer than the Jews got. Isn't it time for us to see the light? That we, as the body of Christ, a nation of kings and priests who have a king and a priest and a nation, and a law that we should come out of this man-made apostasy, this man-made usurpation, and proclaim our liberty in Christ whom we receive and believe and accept and champion and condemn his counterfeit that has enslaved the whole world? Why should we get more time than the Jews? Only by God's grace, but I can't believe that my God, who is no respecter of persons, would give me and my people, the Gentiles, any more time than he gave the Jews. I'm trying to tell you, time's up. If God doesn't apply to us the same standard that he applied to the Jews. It's only by the grace of Almighty God. And we've got work to do, big-time work, dangerous work. But it's a holy work to restore true Bible-believing Protestantism to this country. Henry Gratton Dennis continues. He says... He who had raised up the prophets and apostles in olden times, he who raised up confessors and witnesses in the Middle Ages, raised up reformers in the 16th century, lion-like men to undertake this mighty enterprise and accomplish this glorious work. There was that lion Luther, Martin Luther, who shook Rome and Europe with his roar. And that lion, Tyndale, who wrenched the Bible from the priest's hands and gave it to us here in England, in our own mother tongue, though it cost him his life to do it. And that Swiss lion, Zwingli, who fell on the battlefield, and that lion, Picardy, John Calvin, who rose in his strength and majesty when Zwingli fell, and that lion, John Knox of Scotland, who feared not the face of man and turned not aside for anyone. These and such as these were the men through whom God overthrew in Germany, in Switzerland, in France, in England, Scotland, and Holland, the diabolical power and dominion of the papacy. We wish to invite your special attention to the fact that the convictions of the Protestant reformers with reference to the character of the papal church, the Roman Catholic church, the scarlet harlot of Revelation chapter 17, 
and the duty of separation from it were largely derived from their study and interpretation of the prophetic scriptures, the prophecies. Whose prophecies? Daniel's, Paul's, and John's. They were absolutely correct. He says, we invite you to consider the manner in which the reformers interpreted the prophecies bearing upon the papal apostasy, the practical use which they made of those prophecies, and the power which these prophecies exerted in directing and sustaining the great work of the Protestant Reformation. What does he attribute? What does Henry Graddon Guinness attribute to the success of the Protestant Reformation, the sustaining of the Protestant Reformation, the direction of the Protestant Reformation? Why? The prophecies of Daniel, Paul, and John, and their fulfillment in the papacy. That's what drove the Protestant Reformation. That was the fuel that fired the Protestant Reformation that liberated the whole Roman Catholic world. Yes, Jesus is the Christ, the Redeemer and Savior of mankind. But that counterfeit in Rome, sitting in that simoniacal church, that idolatrous church plated with gold, silver, precious stones, and pearls, that church in Rome that has the golden cup in her hand full of abominations of the filthiness of her fornication, that that persecutes the saints, that kills God's people, that corrupts the Bible, that stands between God and his maker, that antichrist, that is what fueled the Protestant Reformation. Where is it to be heard in this country today? He says, to the Protestant reformers, Rome was the quote-unquote Babylon of the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation, and the papal pontiff, the pope, the predicted quote-unquote man of sin. Separation from the Church of Rome and from its pontifical head was regarded by them, the Protestant reformers, unanimously as a sacred duty. They urged on all Christian persons within the Church of Rome the apocalyptic command, quote, unquote, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins and that ye receive not of her plagues. Revelation chapter 18, verse 4 and 5, and when the Protestant reformers finally understood that Revelation chapter uh Chapter uh, 18, verse 4 and 5, which I just read, then they understood that there was no reforming that church. It was irreformable. God said, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Let me finish it. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities, which means she is not forgiven any of her sins. And she will be destroyed when Christ returns. That's when the Protestant Reformation finally realized there's no reforming the Roman Catholic Church. And from then on, they were known as Protestants. I don't intend to reform the Roman Catholic Church. I don't even hope to reform the Roman Catholic Church. I only intend to do what the Scripture says, command God's people to come out of that system. That's their only hope, or they will be destroyed with her. It says, come out of her that ye be not partakers in her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. You either come out or you will be counted guilty of all of her sins and you will receive the punishment due her. That's a warning from God Almighty. 
That's not Henry Grattan Dennis. That's not Tom Fress. That's no mortal man. That is Christ himself. Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers in her sins, that ye receive not also of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath, what? Not forgiven. God hath remembered her iniquities. The cry of God's people have reached unto heaven. The triple tyrant of Rome has suppressed God's people, tormented God's people, laid economic and other sanctions on God's people, burned them at the stake, spilled their blood, coerced them into fighting wars for her behalf, cheated them out of their their living, stolen their land, taken away the Bible, corrupted the Bible, done every sin under heaven. And he's finally heard the cries of God's people. And judgment is imminent. So if you're still in that Roman system, you've got but a little while to get out. And those of us who are not servants to Rome, at least not in spirit, better understand that we have been duped into serving a system that is literally the mirror image of that system, and we come under the same warning. We have to come out of this system, or we will be partakers of her sins, and we will also partake of her plagues. Judgment is coming, and I want no stain of Romanism on my life. I want God to forget my iniquity not to remember them. To the Protestant reformers, separation from the Roman Catholic Church was not separation from Christ, but from Antichrist. This was the principle upon which they began and prosecuted the war, the work of the Protestant Reformation, the principle which directed and supported them and rendered them invincible. That's right. Right makes might. When you are on God's side, who can be against you? You are invisible. The only, ob- the only objective in your life is to be on the side of right, to be on the side of Christ and against Antichrist. How could this message be made more clear? He says, take first the case of the Protestant reformer Martin Luther. Early in the year 1520, he wrote to Spalatinus thus, quote, I'm extremely distressed in my mind. I've not much doubt that the Pope is the real Antichrist. Remember, Martin Luther was a Roman Catholic. He's just now, in 1520, being, being convinced by the Scriptures that the papacy is the Antichrist, whom he had served all his life. He was a Roman Catholic monk. Okay. Up until this time, he was only upset at the Roman Catholic Church because they presumed to sell indulgences, the forgiveness of sins for money, simony to help finance that golden monstrosity in the Vatican called St. Peter's Basilica. He was ticked off. The priests were robbing the people of their money and their land. Those Simoniacs who went all throughout Europe were not so proud but to take anything they could get their priestly grubby mitts on, including the land of Europe. Martin Luther understood this was not according to the Scripture. This this was diabolical. So we led his protest to Rome. Remember, he's a Roman Catholic monk. He's protesting the Vatican, his spiritual and civil sustainer. He could have been excommunicated from the church, and he was. That means to a Roman Catholic that he'd be eternally damned to burn and writhe in the flames of hell forever and ever and ever. But Martin Luther knew the truth. You can't buy your way to heaven. You can't buy to have your sins forgiven. Certainly not to have your money go to a gold-plated church 
in Rome. And a 1,100-room apartment complex for the Pope and his entourage. It just wasn't right. The God of the Holy Bible would not permit such a thing. The shepherd, the lamb of the almighty God who had not a place to even lay his head would support Rome and Simony? Martin Luther wouldn't have it. He says, I'm extremely direct, distressed in my mind. I have not much doubt but that the Pope is the real Antichrist. The lives and conversation of the Pope's their actions, their decrees. See, Martin Luther was a monk. He was aware of the history, the diabolical, the sickening history of the popes from his time forward. He wasn't kidding himself. He read the books. He knew what sickness was in the papacy. He says the lives and conversation of the popes, their actions, their decrees, all agree most wonderfully to the descriptions of him in Holy Writ in the Bible. Who do you think he's talking about? The man of sin, the little horn of Daniel, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Judas priest, the Antichrist. He says in the autumn of the same year, he printed a treatise on Babylonish captivity of the church. Do you know that you can read this online? It's free online. Do you want to read it? Go to Google and type in Babylonish captivity of the church. That's right. Martin Luther, a Roman Catholic monk, a Protestant reformer by the grace of Almighty God, called the Roman Catholic Church and her control of Europe Babylon the Great. And he said, Babylon, he titled his work, Babylonish Captivity of the Church. You can tell by the title, Martin Luther had come out of that church. He'd separated himself from that church. He wasn't going to be a partaker in her sins, and he wasn't going to be, he wasn't about to be a partaker in her plagues. And he wrote a book to identify her, to condemn her, and to warn the rest of God's people all throughout Europe to have come out. Read it for yourself. By Martin Luther, by his own hand, Babylonish Captivity of the Church. Such was the title. In this he exposed the imposture of indulgences. He showed that their object is to rob men of money by the perversion of the gospel. In this animated production, Martin Luther called the papacy, quote, listen, this is Martin Luther talking about the papacy. He says, quote, the kingdom of Babylon, unquote. You know something you start to realize? Martin Luther is starting to believe the same thing as William Tyndale, us, Jerome, the Huguenots, the Hussites, the Albigensians and the Waldenses, and even the first century Christians. The light of the truth had finally come to Martin Luther, and he was not about to keep his mouth shut about it, even at pain of death. He wrote a book, and guess you know, the Pope got a copy of it and read it, and he sent out a hit squad to get Martin Luther. Of course, that was nothing new. The Popes had done that all throughout their history. Kill the heretics. We do God's service when we kill those who oppose Christ's vicar on the earth. Right? That's true history. That's a history you'll never get from the government. That's a history you'll never get from your church. That's a history you'll never get from the public school system. Why? Because the whole kit and caboodle serves the Antichrist of Rome and has got you enslaved, and they don't want you to spring free. But Martin Luther, an abject slave of the papacy, knowing it would eventually cost him his life, told the truth. Would to God there were men like Martin Luther in this world today. He says, meanwhile, Leo X, Pope, or rather, Antichrist Pope Leo X, 
published his famous damnatory bull against Martin Luther, containing extracts from his work and forbidding all persons to read his writings on pain of excommunication, commanding those who possessed his works to burn them, excommunicating Martin Luther as an obstinate heretic, delivered to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, and commanding all secular princes, that's presidents, vice presidents, kings, queens, and potentates of every government of the world, commanding all secular princes under pain of incurring the same censure, that's excommunication and eternal damnation, and forfeiting all their dignities to seize Martin Luther's person that he might be punished as his crimes deserved. Even in the death throes of the papacy, when the Protestant Reformation, the light of the Protestant Reformation, was going to light up all of the darkness of Roman Catholic Europe, the papacy is still hurling the damnations and anathema against God's people threatening eternal damnation, excommunication from the church, and making him a criminal of criminals to seize his person, his property, his goods, and to make him pay for blaspheming the Pope. That was death by fire. That age-old means of exterminating the heretics. Rome turned it into a science. It says, in October of the same year, Martin Luther wrote to Spilatinus, quote, at last the Roman bull is come, and Echius is the bearer of it. I treat it with contempt. You see that the express doctrines of Christ himself are here condemned. I feel myself now more at liberty. Listen to this. Listen to this. Martin Luther, who had resigned his life to tell the truth, found liberty. Look what he said. I feel myself now more at liberty, being assured that the popedom is anti-Christian and the seat of Satan, unquote. Do you want liberty? Real liberty, the same kind of liberty that Martin Luther enjoyed. All you have to do is come to the realization that the triple tyrant in Rome is perfectly the fulfillment of the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the counterfeit Christ that deceiveth the whole world. And to realize that that same Antichrist controls the government of the United States and all the laws of this land and has made you an abject slave, happy or not about it, you are enslaved, no less than were the Israelites under Pharaoh. And all of that after, after, 500 years after the Protestant Reformation. It only took 500 years for Rome to enslave us once again. Can you imagine Christ being on his throne and looking down with his clock? 500 years. That's all it took, 500 years. They're enslaved again. They've given up the liberty. They've forgotten the liberty wherewith I had made them free, and they have voluntarily made themselves slave once again to the modern-day Pharaoh. What must he think? What do we owe him? But to comply with his command, come out of her, my people, that you partake not of her sins, and that you receive not also of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. On December 1st, he published two tracts in answer to the bull, one of which was entitled, 
Martin Luther against the execrable bull of Antichrist. <laughs> Can you imagine a Roman Catholic monk writing a handwritten letter to the Pope and calling him in the title of your work, the Antichrist? I can. Boy, howdy, can I ever. Where do I get that gig? Right? In its conclusion, he admonishes the Pope and his cardinals no longer to persevere in madness, no longer to act the undoubted part of the Antichrist of the Scriptures, unquote. Let me read it again. In the conclusion of his work, entitled Martin Luther Against the Execrable Bull of Antichrist, he says to persevere no longer in madness, no longer to act the undoubted, the undoubted part of the Antichrist of Scriptures, unquote. You know that the church named after Martin Luther today, the Lutheran Church, was the first to lay down its Protestant arms and to ecumenically unite with the Roman Catholic Church and the papacy. And it just happened not long ago. How much blindness has come over the Lutheran Church? It no longer deserves the title Lutheran Church. It deserves the title Synagogue of Satan. The Benedict Arnold of Christianity. That's what the Lutheran Church deserves. I call them ecumenical evangelical bellies. Ecumenical evangel. You've got to be a maniac to give up the liberty of Christ and to put yourself voluntarily back under the authority of the triple tyrant of Rome after being liberated by the Protestant Reformation and the knowledge that the papacy is none else but the Antichrist of Scripture. You've got to be a maniac. You've got to have lost your mind to submit to the authority of the papacy, and that's what the, the Lutheran Church has done. If Martin Luther could see today what has become of that church who took his name, he wouldn't turn in his grave. He'd come out of it and stone them all to death. You call that an exaggeration? Wait and see what happens when Christ returns. It will be destroyed. And Martin Luther won't even have to lift a finger. He says on December 10th of the same year in 1520, Martin Luther called together the professors and students of the town of Wittenberg and publicly burned the papal bull. For those of you who don't know, a papal bull is a document written normally by the very hand of the pope And it is the most powerful, the most authoritative form of communication that a pope can issue. And it is believed that the bulls of the pope are equal, if not greater than, the word of God itself. A papal bull, once written and signed and sealed by the Antichrist, the pope, is irreformable. The Pope can't even change it because he is infallible. And the church, the Roman Catholic Church, according to Roman Catholic canon law, is also infallible. And the Pope issued a bull of damnation against Martin Luther. What did Martin Luther do? (laughs) He took the bull as though it were so much toilet paper and burned it in the trash. You talk about guts. Where is the guts like that in what is known as Christianity in this country today? I mean, we can barely speak a peep against the tyranny coming from Washington, D.C. Who would dare 
say such a thing or do such a thing to the Pope of Rome. He says, along with it, he burned the canon law. That's the law of the Roman Catholic Church. Do you know what canon law consists of? All the bulls of all the popes, all the antichrists throughout history. They are irreformable. They become law in the church. And Martin Luther burned the whole lot in the same fire that he burnt the bull of excommunication from the current antichrist. He also burned the decretals, that is, the decrees of the popes. No, he didn't just burn the canon law. He burned the decretals and the clementines, all a part of the Roman Catholic canon law, and the extravagantes of the popes. That's all, everything that the popes had ever published throughout, at that time, 1,500 years of its existence. Martin Luther loaded it all up, took it outside, and threw it on the ground and lit it a fire right along with the bull. Look, Martin Luther excommunicated the church, didn't he? <laughs> yeah. Where is that kind of spiritual drive today? Martin Luther, I don't worship the man. He's not my God. He had, so he still, you know, he was a young reformer. He made some mistakes, you know, uh, you know, sanctification is a lifelong process. And I have to believe that by the time Martin Luther died, he was pretty solid in his doctrine. At first, he made a few mistakes, but he was right about one thing. That is that the Pope is the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn, the Antichrist of the Bible, and he owed no obedience or allegiance to him but to condemn him and burn his writings. And that's exactly what he did. Now the die is cast. Luther had declared war. War! Martin Luther, the Protestant reformer, once a Roman Catholic monk, had declared open war against a Roman pontiff. What peace treaty would a true man of God ever make with the Antichrist, the antithesis of Christ, the counterfeit Christ, no, Martin Luther wouldn't make no treaties, not even if a threat of death and excommunication, eternal damnation, no. He declared open warfare against the papacy. He had, quote, boldly denominated him the man of sin and exhorted all Christian princes to shake off his usurpation. That's right, he beseeched his own German government to take off the crowns that the Pope had put on their heads, give up all the power and authority vested in them by the Pope, take it all off and tell the Pope where to stuff it. Do you think anybody there have the gumption to go out to Washington, D.C., walk into the White House, address the president, and say, in the name of Jesus Christ, I abjure you to remove from this house any vestige of papal power. Renounce your allegiance to the papacy and serve Christ. Is there anybody in this country that would have the nerve to do what Martin Luther did? He exhorted all Christian princes, not just the one in Germany under whom he was ruled, but all Christian princes. Of course, Christian meant Roman Catholic. And, Lord, you already have to know, as long as we've been into this book, all the kings and princes were papal princes. They got their power and authority from the Pope, or they wouldn't have any power and authority at all. Rome ruled the world. Rome, you had no power in this world except what the Pope gave you. And if they were a king and they had an office in the civil government, they, they owed their existence to the papacy. And Martin Luther had the gall, the unmitigated gall, the holy gall, to stand up and command all princes 
in the Christian world to shake off the Pope's usurpations. Martin Luther was a hero, a blood-bought hero, and he was only doing his faithful service to Christ. His faithful service. His rightful service. At that point, he had but one king, and that was Christ Jesus. And he wanted to liberate all men, all princes, all potentates from Rome's diabolical anti-Christ usurpations and enjoy with him the liberty whereby Christ had made us free. In this manner was the Protestant Reformation inaugurated. That's right, it had a stormy beginning, a stormy sunrise. Henry Grattan Dennis described it, a stormy sunrise. Would to God that those storms return, especially here in the United States of America. I hate it, but I've run out of time. I was just getting warmed up. (laughs) We'll begin next Sunday, the first day of the week, by the way. The last paragraph on page 230 will continue our reading and discussion about what the interpreters of the prophecies of Paul, John, and Daniel believed at the time during and after the Protestant Reformation, and you end up asking yourself, whatever happened to Protestantism in this country? I call myself a Protestant, yet I believed in futurism. I got a whole lot of repenting to do. I got a whole lot of work to do. And I got a whole lot of fighting to do. In the name of Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the Savior of the world, against the triple tyrant of Rome, We must start at the foot of the cross. For our souls in danger, we're at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know, there is heaven, also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross. To the prison of hell he will send just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away go to the foot of the cross this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross, without our Savior we're total loss.